Now, everybody at that moment said they were ready to go to fight. First thing he told them to say, he said, anybody that's afraid or downhearted or weak-hearted, he said, go on back home. He lost, I think, about 30,000 with just that one statement. So that means everybody who was there wasn't all there in heart. They was there in body, but not in heart. And they left because of fear. The devil, the main thing he wants to do, he wants to distract fear into your heart. So if he feels like if he killed one, guess what? The rest of them will be afraid, and they'll start compromising. And they'll start giving up in those beliefs and things that they hold fast to in their faith. And he said, I know where Satan dwells. In other words, John is trying to tell us, they say this really in control of this city. You, have you ever been somewhere where you just say, boy, it's like the devil just running everything? You ever seen that? Sometimes you sit around on a job and you say to yourself, good, great, is anybody saved? Anybody feel God? Sometimes you go to places and you see the devil just running wild, rampant. And he's doing that, seem like today. And so John wants you to know the devil is really in this city where they are at. There are still some who hold him fast to the faith. All right? Now look at verse 14. He said, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that holds the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things, sacrifice, and the idol, and to commit fornication. Now, the Lord said, I have a few things against thee. Now, the charge against this church I have was somewhat different from that against the church at Ephesus. The charge there was that they had left their first love. But it is spoken in comm commendation of them that they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, let's read verse 15 also. He said, not only did they have those who taught the doctrine of Balaam in the 14th verse, but look what he said in the 15th verse. He says, so has thou also them that hold the doctrine of the nicolatine, which things, he say, I hate. So now they got two peoples inside this church who are carrying two false doctrines. They've compromised their faith, and they've accepted the outside teaching. Now, he said, he said that the first church that we read about was Ephesus. They hated the deeds in that church. Isn't that amazing? One church can hate something, and another church will welcome it. That's why we have so much confusion in the, in the, in the church world today. Some say you can allow homosexual marriages. Some say you can't. Some say you can go along with this. Others say you can't. But then, it, 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 it really, what it does, it weakens the faith. Because the one that's standing against the devil and the one that's compromising with the devil is hurting the witness over here who's standing for God. And so the thing is, this here, the Bible tells us to say a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. If you allow little things to come in your life, little sin can do more damage than you think. One thing about sin is like cancer. It may start off small, but if you let it go unattended, un, uh, uh, it will destroy your whole body. Same thing with this here. They was allowing a little bit of yeast in to the loaf. And then one, one thing about yeast, I know my mom, used, we used to call it sweet biscuits or sweet bread. She put that yeast in that bread right and boy, that thing be good. Huh? But the thing is, this, <laughs> they had allowed this to come into the church. So here the charge is that they tolerated that sect among them. Despite their courageous stand against persecution, the believers in Pergamos were not faultless before the Lord. A group of compromising peoples had infiltrated the church fellowship, and Jesus Christ hated their doctrine and their practice. Now, this tells me something. Most of God's people know what the Lord don't like. Even some people in the world know what God don't like. So, it ain't nothing new when the Lord said, you know I hate this practice. You know I hate those people. You know I hate this religion. You know I hate this cult. It ain't nothing new about that. But we try to sometimes blind our eyes to the truth, but 
God ain't going to let you because he's coming with you with a sharp two-edged sword. All right? He's going to get to you one way or the other. All right? And then he said, and that they had among them also those who held the doctrine of Balaam. Now, the meaning is that they taught substantially the same doctrine which Balaam did and deserved to be classed with him. Now, what the doctrine was is stated in the subsequent part of the verse. What is, what, what is Balaam's doctrine? This is it right here. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. How many of y'all know the story of Balaam and Balak? How many in the church know the story? Now, some people don't know the story. How many of y'all ever heard somebody say a donkey talked? Huh? Well, this is also a part of this story. But the main thing is this here. What he's telling us in Revelation, most people don't read that far in the Word of God. Most people read what it says in number from chapter 22 to chapter 24. But to find out what he's telling about Balaam doctrine, You'll see it later on in the scripture. All right? Now, what Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, the word stumbling block properly means anything over which one falls or stumble, and then anything over which anyone may or fall into sin, which becomes occasion of one falling into sin. The meaning here is that it was through the instruction of Balaam that Balak learned the way by which the Israelite might be led into sin and might thus bring upon themselves divine displeasure. Understanding the story of Balaam helps us interpret this insidious group more accurately. Balaam was a true prophet who prostituted his gifts in order to earn money from King Balak, who hired him to curse the people of Israel. God prevented Balaam from actually cursing the nation. In fact, God turned the curses into blessings. But Balak still got his money's worth. How? By following Balaam's advice and making friends with Israel and then inviting the Jews to invite, inviting the Jews to worship and feast at a pagan altar. Devil is always using this, this statement. If you can't beat him, what he'll do? He'll join you. Now, we read the story of Numbers, the 22nd chapter to the 25th chapter. And when you read it, you read about Balaam. Balak coming to Balaam with money. He offered him money. He was a true prophet of God. God actually communed with him. And Balak knew Balaam's reputation was that if you curse somebody, they was cursed. If you bless somebody, they was blessed. And so he offered him money. But Balak was a money-loving prophet. <laughs> In other words, he'll sell his gift for whatever money that was the highest bidder. But when he found out about it, he didn't know Israel. He didn't know what God had did for Israel. So Balak saw Israel coming into his country. There was a number like the sand. He couldn't count them, but so many of them. So he sent his men, his, his officials, to go to Balaam and tell him, he said, look, I'm going to give you all this money if you'll just come and curse these people. So Balaam told him, said, y'all stay here. And I go see what the Lord say. And he said, I'll come back to you in the morning. Well, he went that night. He talked to the Lord. The Lord told him, say, who are those beings? He said, are they are bella officials. And they want me to come and curse some people. God said, don't you curse them people. Them people are blessed. All right? Now, when God tell you don't do something, and when God tell you he blessed those people, you can't curse them. All right? But Bella wasn't satisfied. The first time, he went back, he told him, he said, well, Lord told me I can't curse them people. Y'all go on, take your money back and don't do that. He wouldn't compromise. He, he stood fast that first time. But how many of y'all know the devil ain't going to stop? Devil figure out, I'll get you, if, you, if I don't get you with this, I'll try this. All right? So he sent back other delegates with more higher positions and with more money. And so, Bev said, stay right here. Now, the thing is, God done told you what? These peoples are blessed, and you can't curse them. Now, if God done told you that, and God's word is absolute, that's the truth, why are you talking about, I got to go back to God and see what he's saying? In other words, you're telling God, hey, maybe it is some way we can curse these people, Lord. But God done told you. You understand? 
So God told them, I'll tell you what. In the morning, if they be if you want to go with them, you go with them. All right. So the thing is this. What you gonna go with them for? The only reason they want you to go with them is to curse these people that God say that they are blessed. Now, if you know that God said you can't curse them, why are you in a hurry to go with them? See, money blinded him, caused him to compromise. See, the devil figured we all got a price. We all got something that we'll give in for. And so the thing is, you can read the story. I just wrote it down there. But the thing is this here, is that when Balaam went, God got mad. Because God sees in his heart that he's determined to want to curse these people, even though I didn't told him. He can't. Have you ever had God to tell you you can't do something, but you just gonna figure out a way you're gonna get oh Lord, Lord, you going this is the way you compromise. Because when once God say you can't, that should be it for you. But you're gonna keep going on, keep going on. God keep telling you no, 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 but you're gonna keep going on, keep going on, then what you gonna do? You're gonna compromise. And then you're gonna find yourself in a bunch of trouble. All right. So the thing is this, he 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 went. And when he went, God sent an angel to kill him. Only thing he said his life was a donkey. The donkey saw the angel. The first time he went out the way. So the angel went another way. He went up a little further. When he saw him that time, he eased by. So the angel went up a little further. He got him away. You can't come through. You got to come by me. So the donkey, instead of going by through the angel, he just sighed out. And Bela whipped him, said, I'll kill you if I have a sword in my hand. Now the donkey started talking to him. And the fool talked back to the donkey. And at no time did he see himself in sin. You see, you could be so blind until you can't recognize what's even actually going on in your life. God could be speaking to you, talking to you, even from a donkey's mouth. And the thing is, is how amazing this is, this is an animal. And the animal had enough sense to know, man, we get in trouble. And he couldn't see the trouble. And so the angel said, if it wasn't for that donkey... He said, I would have done killed you by now. You understand? Because he was determined to get there, to get that money, and to curse the people who God told him he couldn't curse. So he said, go on, but I don't want you to say no more than what God tell you to say. And so he went. And when he went, he got there. God said the same thing. Bless the peoples. Kept, did it one time. Then Bill like said, let's try it again. Maybe we take it to another mountain. God took him to, to, he took him to another mountain, and God blessed him again. He said, hold up. Let's go to a third mountain. Now, let me tell you something. He, this is how determined he was to try to get him to compromise. You, the, the, the lesson tonight is that the devil won't give up, y'all. You're going to have to hold your ground in every situation that comes up in your life. You know, if, if, he, he, if, if flowers don't work, I'll get you some candy. If candy don't work, I'll buy you some tickets to a, a, a cruise. If a, if a cruise don't work, I'll buy you a, a trip to Paris. If Paris don't work, I'll, I'll buy you a diamond ring. If a diamond ring don't work, he going to do whatever it takes to do what? Get you to compromise. He don't, and that's the lesson. That's the doctrine of Balaam. It, 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 it tries to teach you how to get people to fall, how to get people to fall into sin. How to, it's a stumbling block. It's something to put in a person's way to get them to what? To fall. And, 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 and the thing about this is that Balaam, three times, three times he went. And three times, <laughs> and all the times he went, God didn't tell him anything to curse the children of Israel. You know what God told him to curse? The last time he told him to say, you curse Balak. You let him know what I'm going to do to him and his people. Now, that's something bad. Now, you, if, if you can't take the three blessings out of these people, now, nah, you just tell him what I'm going to do to him and his people. But I want you to look at this here. Go to Numbers 24 and 25. This is at the end of all the, the times that Balak took Balaam to d different mountain sites so he can get him to curse Israel. I want you to look and see what happened there. Then we're going to go back to our notes. Notice what it says at 24, Numbers 24 and 25. It says this here. It says, And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place 
And Balak also went his way. Now, that's how the story ends. It looked like, okay, it ain't going to work. It looked like it's over with, right? But what did I say about the devil? He don't never stop. It looked like he left Jesus in the wilderness, and he ain't coming back no more. But we know he did what? He only left for a season. He come back again. Now, look at what it says. Balaam returned to his house, but evidently with a desire to still gratify Balak, being forbidden to curse the people of Israel, having been overruled in all his purposes to do it, have it been contrary to his own desire, constrained to bless them when he himself was more willing to curse them. And having still a desire to comply with the wishes of the king of Moab, he sought about for some way in which the object might yet be accomplished, that is, in which the curse of God might in fact rest upon the Hebrew peoples and they might become exposed to the divine displeasure. To do this, no way occurred so possible that had such a probability of success as to lead them into idolatry and into the sinful and corrupt practice connected with idolatry. It was therefore resolved to make use of the charm of the females of Moab, that through their influence the Hebrews might be drawn into lasciviousness. This was done, and the abomination of idolatry spread through the camp of Israel, and lasciviousness everywhere prevailed, and God sent a plague upon them to punish them. Now go to Numbers 25. Remember what they said. They said they left, and they both went back to their places. But Balaam went back with a grudge. <coughs> he didn't want to give up all that money. He wanted to get that money. And he felt like it was somewhere I could curse these people. So he went back and he was thinking about how he can cause Israel to sin. All right. Now look what numbers. Do y'all have numbers 25? Now it said that he had went back to his place. Balak went back to his place. So you would assume the devil was finished with them. But he was. He went back and he thought about something he could do that would cause a curse. Now I'm going to tell you something. This teaches you something else. The devil can't get you to compromise. You have to willingly do it. All right? He's just going to present the temptation, the allurement, but you got to willingly fall for the trap. He can't curse you. God's to bless you. But you can curse yourself. All right? Now, do y'all have Numbers 25? It said, Israel abode in Sedom, and the peoples began to commit what? Hold them with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people to the sacrifice of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. Who's, it doesn't say whose idea this is, does it? You don't see that until you get to Numbers 31. But this is Balaam giving advice to Balak. He said, I can't curse them, but they can get into God's displeasure if you invite them to a worship service of your God and get them to bow down to your God and commit hold on with the women's or Moabites and then God will get mad with them and he'll kill them. And he did. God killed 24,000 of them for doing what they did here in the 25th chapter. 24,000 people died. He sent the plague among them and all the way the plague was staying because one of them ran in, into the camp while God was telling Moses he won't kill the people and Moses was trying to stand in between the plague and the people and, and one of them uh, Moabite women and one of the Israelite Hebrew ran into their tent. And they go into the tent having sex right in the tent. And the Bible said that uh, Aaron's sons went in there with the spear and killed both of them right there. And when he did that, then the plague was stopped. But now God going to wipe them out. That plan came from Balaam. But you don't see that there. Now I turn to the 31st chapter of Numbers. Thirty-one and thirteen, do you have it? Thirty-one 
and 13. And Moses and Eliezer the priest and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp. And Moses was wrought with the officers of hosts, with the captains over a thousand, and the captains over a hundred, which, 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 which came from the battle. And Moses said unto them, Have you saved all the women alive? Behold, these calls, what? The children of Israel through what? To do what? And we just read that in the 25th chapter. See, that was through Balaam counsel to Balak to put a curse on the children of Israel. In other words, he put a stumbling block before them, caused them to sin, to cause them to fall. You don't see that back in the 25th chapter, but as you read on, you find out it was him who came up with the plot. It wasn't Belloc. He did it. That's why Moses killed him, too. You read that also <laughs> later on. But the thing is, is this. The attitude, we're back to our notes on page three. The attitude of Belloc's mind in the matter was this. He had a strong desire to do that which he knew was wrong and which was forbidden expressly by God. He sought about for some way in which he might do this. And this is not an unfair description of what often occurred in the plans and purposes of wicked men. See, wicked people have a strong desire to do that which they know God ain't pleased with. They know God don't want you to do this. They know God ain't going to be pleased. But they got a strong desire to bring that stumbling block before you. And they won't stop until they get you to what? To your fall. And so, the meaning in the passage before us, that in the church of Pergamos, there were those who taught substantially the same thing that Balaam did. That is, the tendency of whose teaching was to lead men astray into idolatry. And the ordinary accompaniment of idolatry is lasciviousness, which means disregarding accepted rules and standards, and morally unrestrained, especially in sexual activity. In other words, they had people going around leading people astray, and they know God wasn't pleased with it. And they know the thing that they were teaching was wrong. And yet still, they still was teaching it in the church, and they knew God wasn't pleased with it. You know what? We, we, let's read to the book of uh, Romans, the first chapter. Look what it says at the end of the first chapter of Romans. You know, it's bad enough. You go down the hole. <laughs> but don't bring me with you. Better live the hole lead to a sewage. <laughs> but some of them who go down the hole, they want to bring you with you. They, wanna, they want, want, want you to think that they are doing the right thing. But look at what it says in Romans 132. What it says. It says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. He said, they not only do the same, but what? But have pleasure in them. That now, they know what they're doing is worthy of death. But instead of them trying to stop somebody, they have pleasure in leading other people on that same path. And so, Balaam's problem was this here. I'm going to get them to fall. They are not going to. You have some people today who know you're a Christian, who know you believe in God, they are determined to take your testimony from you. I believe you're going to give in. I believe you're going to deny your faith. I believe you're going to turn your back on God. This is what I call when it comes about compromising. You see, you, you in the church, you're all right now. But when you go out there, that's somebody out there who going to try you? And you could tell them, I've given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. He's my King. And they hear you. But guess what? They're going to see if that's true. Peter stood at the table. He told Jesus, he said, I'll die for you. Everybody else is betrayed. Everybody else is running from you. I ain't going to run. I'm going to stand. Jesus said, before the night over, you're going to deny me three times. For the chicken cry, crow twice. <coughs> he said, you're going to deny me three times. He said, no. <coughs> never will I do that. And I'm going to tell you something. And it wasn't no, wasn't no, no sword at Peter's neck. It wasn't no game of men getting ready to jump on him. The Bible said it was a dancer. 
a little young maid came by and said, you look like one of them fellas. All she said, you look like you go to that church over there, the most sanctified people church. I remember in the day when, 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 uh, when you used to be saved and people would say you're sanctified, and then you want to hear them, oh, you, you're one of the most sanctified people. You go to one of the most sanctified churches. And, and they say that to try to get you to be ashamed. You understand? They, they want to know, do you really love being saved or, or not? Because you couldn't wear, especially back then, they couldn't wear pants, they couldn't wear makeup. And they say, oh, you one of the most, most sanctified folks. And, and they come at you like that because they want to make you feel ashamed. But you'd be surprised today, they ain't got to go that far. And you still ain't going to claim anything. But the thing is, this, the, the Lord wants us to see in this is that how far the enemy will go to get you to deny your faith. How far he will get you to try to bow down your rules. And then not only that, he said they also ate things offered unto idols. Sometimes the enemy, like he said, if he can't whoop you, he'll join you. And what he'll do, he'll try to take you to places where you know you ain't got no business going. And if you go to these places, you bound to fall. I, I, I'm going to tell you now. I hear people say, ain't no harm in going to a bar. Yeah, probably ain't. But if you go there enough, you're going to do what they do in the bar. Is that not true? And some people say, ain't no harm to go to this place or that place. I mean, if I keep going to the, to the number house, <laughs> I ain't going there to see how they play numbers. <laughs> Eventually, I'll put some money on them numbers eventually if I keep going there. What they did, they would lead the peoples. I'm just going to read it. Balaam taught the Hebrews to do this, perhaps in some way securing their attendance at a riotous and gluttonous feast of idolatry celebrated among the people by teaching that there could be no harm in eating what had been offered in sacrifice. Since an idol was nothing, the flesh of the animal offered in sacrifice was the same as if slaughtered for some other purpose. It was seen that these teachers of Pergamos had induced profession Christians to attend those kind of feasts. Now, ain't nothing wrong with going to parties. But there are some parties I know I ain't going to go to. Because you go to them parties, you get with your friends, you see all that old stuff you used to do, and you hear all that old music you used to dance. Oh, you can you hang it for a little while. <laughs> but after a while, you keep going to them parties. After a while, you can say what you want to say. You're going to start drinking. You're going to start smoking. You're going to start snorting. You're going to start, and I say smoking, I'm talking about weed, y'all. I ain't talking about cigarettes. Huh? You're you going to start snorting. And you're going to be glam dancing. Then after a while, you're going to be sleeping around. All this stuff will start happening just because you went to that party that was no harm. You understand? There are certain places where you can't go because Satan is enthroned there. And there's a reason why he's enthroned there because he's running things there. You put your feet on the enemy territory, don't expect the enemy to welcome you. He's going to try to destroy you because why? You are his enemy. You go to these places. I mean, one more one time when I was on the job, she asked me for a ride home. She didn't have no ride home. I said, okay, I'll take you home. Took her home. Dropped down. She said, come on in the house. Uh, get you something to drink. I said, no, I got to go. I ain't going to hurry. Come on in now. Something told me, say, no, nah, that don't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> it, you, know, you know, you can get a itch. She said, come on. I said, no, nah, I got to go. What, you scared I'm going to do something? No, I'm scared I'm going to do something. <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, I ain't going to let you do nothing. I said, well, you may can't stop me, so I better go. Now, I was just being straight up on it. She laughed. She thought that was funny. But I just told her what I know the devil is trying to do. Because you can, you can say how strong you are, the Lord, and how bad you are, the Lord, but you don't know how strong you are until you get yourself caught up like Samson. Samson got himself caught up on a woman's lap, and he was strong. But when that woman got through with him, he was weak as what? Any other man. For he, when he walked in there, he was as strong as different from any man. His strength came straight from God. But that woman figured out a way to get past his strength and get to his weakness. And she got it. And the Bible says when he got up, 
he shook himself. He didn't even know his power was gone. That's just how bad she had been fooled. And then when she lost all his power, then he was just as weak as any other man. Boy, when the devil, the devil got through with him, he, was, he wished he wouldn't have never saw that woman no more. But you see, they had them eat sacrifices that was given unto idols. They, they caused them to commit fornication. Now, I want that last part where it say, why did this bit of ancient history apply to believers at Pergamos? Because a group in that church said, there is nothing wrong with being friendly to Rome. What harm is that in putting a pinch of incense on the altar and affirming your loyalty to Caesar? Antipas refused to compromise and was martyred. But the others took the easy way and cooperated with Rome. The Lord accused the Christians in Pergamos of sinning and of committing spiritual fornication by saying Caesar is Lord. Of course, this compromise made them welcome in the Roman community and protected them from Roman persecution, but it cost them their testimony and their crown. Believers that they also faced temptation to achieve personal advancement by ungodly compromise. See, the thing is this here, that won't take your testimony so bad you just don't know. If he can take your testimony, he got you. The Bible said they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their what? Testimony. That testimony that you have that Jesus is Lord in your life, that testimony that you have that he's my Savior, the devil want to take that testimony away from you. And so the thing is this here, they thought by compromising that would be better. I'm here to tell you, when you compromise, you go lower than what you was. You might have not have been that high in the first place, but but when you compromise, you go lower than what you were. And the thing is that this here, if you think the devil appreciate that, no, he wants you to get even lower. And the thing is that this here, he don't want you to just stop by giving up. He wants you to continue to get worse and worse and worse. You see, as you read the first chapter of Romans, they just keep getting worse and worse and worse. You see? But the thing is that this here, don't compromise nothing when it comes to the word of God because you don't, it doesn't benefit you as a child of God at all. If somebody tell you to tell a lie, that don't benefit you. If somebody tell you to go sleep with them, that don't benefit you. If somebody tell you to go gamble, that don't benefit you. All these things are the devil tricks and God trying to show us as a church, we have to hold to the truth until the end. And as long as you are on this earth, you are going to be tried and tested and persecuted and talked about. And people, and you think it's over with, it's going to start again. If you think it's through with, it, it's going to start again. And you're going to have to continue to hold. I tell people like this here, if you save, then be saved. You don't see a cow trying to act like a fish, do you? No, because he know he's what? He's a cow. If you know you're a child of God, then why are you acting like a child of the devil? You understand? And if you, if once you accept who you are and know, because see, this is why they, they, they were doing all they could to try to get Jesus to change his way of living and the way of thinking. And all their tests that never work. And, and, and the thing about it this year, the devil ain't for you. Then it said, verse 15, say, those are the Nicolaitans. Now, Nicolaitans were people who want to rule you. They want to lord over you. They want to tell you when to get married, when not to get married, who to marry, when to buy how, when not to buy how, where to put your money, who to give your money to. They want to rule over you. They want to they want to tell you everything about life. They want you to do everything for them. In other words, the word of God tells us it says is about the haughty and the overbearing uh, rulers of his peoples. He said that back in the book of Ezekiel. He's talking about the shepherd, how they starved his peoples and fed themselves. How they didn't look out for his people, but they looked out for themselves. And they didn't do nothing for his people. Well, Peter says, in the book of Peter, he says, God don't want you to be Lord over his sheep. There comes a time, even in your children's life, where you got to let them go. Is that not true? And you can't just keep telling them everything. You know, after a while, they call you mama boy, or they call you daddy daughter. But you got to get to a point where God said you got to leave father and mother, and you got to cleave to your husband or your wife. But some people, they won't leave their father or their mother. They, 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 I had to learn that lesson myself. When my daughter got married, you know, 
God had to come tell me, you got to quit. Because every time she gets in the problem, she called me, Daddy, come up here and talk to him. Now, she's way up in Tampa. But she called me and said, Daddy, he ain't talking to me right. You better come. I'm going to tell him. I told him I'd come back home in a minute. Hey, he don't like it right. I said, I said Tracy, that's your husband. <laughs> you got to start listening to your husband. And you know, he, 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 was, he was all right. You understand? But the fact that the body is, I knew as, as a father, I got to let loose what? My daughter. That's her husband now. I'll give you advice. I told him, I said, now don't you punch my daughter. <laughs> I said, now you feel like you got a whoop or something. You call me, I come up there and get her. Now that's one thing I did tell her. But now, a lot of things she be calling me about, I say, that's your husband. You need to listen to your husband. But some of us want to still run our children's lives even after they've grown. And this is what these people do. They want to run your life. They want to tell you what to do. They don't want you to listen to the Lord. They want you to listen to them. You ever seen people like that? They, they, what their word is is God, not what the Bible say. What did I tell you? Now, you read what the Bible say, but they're going to tell you, what did I tell you? Well, these are the kind of people these Nicolatine was. They, they like the Lord and ruled over people. Now, let's go to verse 16. He said, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against, notice what it says, them. With the sword of what? Of my mouth. He said, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly. The meaning here is that he will come against them in judgment or to punish them. This is not a reference to our Lord's second return, but to a present judgment that come to a church when it is disobedient to the word of God. The Lord presented himself as he which has the sharp sword, so the church could not have been ignorant of its danger. And he said, I will fight against them, against the Nicolaitans, against the doctrine of Balaam disciples. He said, I will come against the church for tolerating them. But his opposition will be pr principally directed against these two groups. If the church would repent or if it would separate itself from the evil, then the Savior would not come against them. If this were not done, they would feel the vengeance of his sword and be subjected to the punishment. The church always suffer when it has offenders in its bosom, and it has the power of saving them if it would repent of its own unfaithfulness and would strive for their conversion. Now, I love Sister Dawson, but if Sister Dawson do something against God's word, I'm going to tell Sister Dawson about herself. All right? Sister Dawson may get mad with me. She may not speak to me. I don't care. <laughs> it's just that way. You understand? You see, sometimes we know people are doing things wrong. And because they're so close to us, we don't want to tell them the truth. You ain't doing them no good. you only hurting that individual as well as your what? Yourself. Because you know it's wrong, and you're allowing it to go on, and you're compromising what you know to be wrong. And saying God ain't pleased with that individual you covered, and he ain't pleased with what? With you. If it's wrong, it's wrong for me, and it's wrong for you. And I, sometimes I get mad when I hear things that saints allow other saints to do, and I say, did you know that was going on in life? And you, what did you do? Oh, well, I, 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 what did you do? I remember some saints did something one time in this church, and, and uh, my wife knew about it, and some other ones knew about it. But they didn't tell me. I found out about it. My daughter told me. And I said, what? I said, that can't be good. She said, yeah. I got both of them. Because, and I got my wife when I got, found out she knew about it. But the thing is this. I don't care the deacons, the saints, brothers, the sisters. That's how we watch out for each other. You're supposed to be watchmen as well as the pastor. But everybody think the pastor's the only one that's supposed to straight out people. No, the pastor ain't the one supposed to. That's why people hate the pastor. But I don't care. But the thing is this here. You trying to be their buddy if you want to be. I got something over me. I got to give an account for souls. That's why a lot of people won't bring their problems to me. Because they know I ain't going to do nothing but tell you exactly what the word of God says. Now, you can go whichever way you want to go after that. But I'm going to tell you what thus says the Lord. And the thing is this here. These, this church had allowed this to go on in the church. And instead of them standing up against this evil, instead of them straightening this evil out, they allowed it to go on. 
So God said, guess what? I'm going to bring judgment against what? Them. You won't handle it. I'll handle it. You understand? And the thing is about this, uh, when God brings judgment, it's, it's worse than what the church would have ever did for you. Worse than what anybody would have ever told you. It's better that you get straightened out by the first brother that come to you than for the two and three to come to you than for the church to even have to deal with you. But the fact of the matter is, God said, I'm going to fight against them. Why is God going to fight against them? Because they are hurting his people. They are hurting his church. By doing those things in the church, it's taking a testimony away from the church. You know, we had a church full of homosexuals and, and all kinds of stuff going on in the church. How much do you think the testimony of the church would stand? Y'all supposed to be Christians? And y'all got Fred and Sam sleeping together? And y'all know about it? Y'all ain't saying that? Y'all got Sister Grim and Sister Bim married to each other? And y'all ain't saying nothing? What you think that's going to do for the church testimony? It's going to bring it down and people are going to want to come to that church. Hey, them, ain't no, them ain't no Christians. Them ain't God kind of people. These people's allowed this to go on in the church. And God said, I'm going to come and I'm going to fight. Guess who God going to fight against? He's going to fight against those who's promoting it in the church. Those who promoting it, them the ones he said, I'm coming after. He said, I'm going to come against those with the doctrine of Balaam, and I'm coming after those who are addicted to it. And then he said, I'm going to come after the church. Because if the church can bear this, I need to get them straight too. Notice he's coming at you with a what? With a sword. Sword that's going to cut everything that's not right out. And I'm going to tell you something about God. God knows what you need to cut. You got too much fat on your head. <laughs> cut that cut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, sometimes we just as fat as we can be. <laughs> Won't listen to nobody. So God said, well, I'm going to cut this off of him. Get this out of the way. Huh? He said, repent or else I will. And God ain't going to waste no time. I'm going to tell you something. God will, when God say quickly, we sometimes we think that uh, that means like tomorrow. Quickly with God could mean a year, could mean six months, could mean three months. But he know when he going to come. He going to give you an opportunity. He gave David almost a year to get his life straight with Bathsheba, but he wouldn't. So he said, okay, I, if you don't want to get it straight, I have to get him straight. And he'll sit now. He could have avoided the sword coming into his house. He could have sworn, he could have avoided all them things he suffered in life because he would not repent. All these things came upon him. Because when, when Nathan got through telling him what the law is going to allow and what the law is going to bring into his house, all that could have been avoided if he just would have what? Repented quickly. Repentance changes things. God said, if you confess your sin, he said, I'm faithful and just to forgive. But when you get up there and say, nah, no, nah, give me another day, give me another hour, give me another month. Okay. That month go by and he wait, see if you're going to repent. Ah! The day to day? Kind of ran out already? He said, okay. Give me a little bit more time. Ah! Oh, Lord, I'm trying. He said, okay. Give me a little bit more time. And then guess what? Did y'all hear about the, 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 the thing they did to Ray Rice? They, they came down on him hard, didn't they? Came down on him hard. Lost a $40 million contract. All because of one little incident. So, you have to see. You never know which way God going to come at you with that knife. But I know one thing. When he brings that knife, whatever he going to cut out of you, it going to come out of you. <laughs> you won't have to worry about it coming back. He going to cut it out. He'll cut it out to a point where you'll be lean. You'll be fine. You'll be just like what the Lord called you from. Because he's going to cut all that out and it ain't going to come back. And when he cut it out, brother, the way God do it, you will quit it. You will stop it. But the fact of the matter is, you don't have to go there. You don't have to go to that position. But if you're going to go to that position, he'll stop you. Then look at verse 17 and we're going to end it. Say, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcome. I will give the eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a name written, which no man knoweth save he that receives it. 
It says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. The true spiritual food, the food that nourishes the soul. The idea is that the soul of those who overcome or who gain victory over the conflict with sin and in the persecution and the trials of the world would be permitted to partake of that spiritual food which is laid up for the people of God and by which they will be nourished forever. Instead of eating things off of the idols, the, be the believers in Pergamos needed to feast on God's holy food, the bread of life found in Jesus Christ through the word. The only thing that gets you over the devil is the word of God. The only thing that keeps you from compromising is the word of God. You know, we get weak because we don't feed our soul. We get weak because we don't keep our soul. I'm not talking about the soul, I'm talking about the inner man. You don't keep him nourished. And, when, and, and that's why you're so weak. Because when the devil come at you, you ain't got nothing in you. You ever try to fight on an empty stomach? It's hard. You see? And if, it, and if your soul is weak, your spirit man is weak. Now how are you going to fight the devil? You got no word in you. Got no spiritual nourishment in you. And then you talk about, I'm going to stand. How are you going to stand? Yeah, man, look here. It's hard to fast three days, eh? Let alone a week. Three days, you fighting everything in your body. Because all you dream about is food. All you walk around what your job is about food. All you smell is food. You even hear food. People talk about food. You hear it. Huh? That's all because why? Because you weak for what? For nourishment. You understand? So if, if you try to stand and you keep thinking about it, people keep offering it to you. Guess what's going to happen? only way that won't work on you is that you got some food in your what? In your belly. When I'm full, you're going to be all the potato pies and, and, and collard greens you want. If I'm full, I don't care. I can walk by. But if I'm hungry, you're going to have some problems on your hands. I hope you cooked enough for you. <laughs> you sure ain't going to get down for me. of his faith, which would have some word or some name inscribed on it, in which will be the use to him alone, and some secret token which would make him sure the favor is redeemed, which would be unknown to other men. Isn't that something? God going to give you something that nobody else got if you overcome. Huh? A stone with a new name written. Huh? which no man knoweth but to him that overcometh. See, God got something special when you stand up against the devil. He got something special in you. Look at what he had for Job. When Job held out, guess what he did for him? He gave him back double. All that he lost, he gave him back double. Huh? When, when Joseph stood up against all the temptations he did, what did God do? God put him second in command in one of the greatest nations in the world. And one day he took him from a prison and put him on the throne. Anytime you stand up for God, God got something special for you. Huh? He got a blessing for you that's just for you and you alone. Huh? Just because you stood up for his name's sake. He said, he that overcome, he said, I got, I got something for him. He said, I'm going to give him a white stone. I'm going to put a, a new name on it, which no man knoweth, and I'm just going to give it to him because why? He overcame. A lot of reasons why a lot of things are happening in your life and why you're being so blessed in your life is because of some of the things that you overcome. Some of the things that normally would have taken you down, but instead you stood up and said, no, nah, I ain't going to go for this here. And because you didn't go for it, God said, I'm going to bless you. 
Huh? You know what God said to Abraham when Abraham had that temptation and he went on up there in the mountain with his son? His only son, his son that he loved, and he offered him up to God and get ready to draw the knife and kill him. What did God say? God said, because you did that for me, brother, I'm going to bless you beyond blessing. Huh? He said, I'm really going to bless you, man. I'm going to show him, shower down those bless. Because why? He did what God said. He didn't compromise. He didn't hold Isaac back. He didn't hold back the knife. He didn't build the blade. He said he was going to kill him. And God said, because you have done this, I'm going to make you great huh? in all the earth. All these things. When you hold out, because the devil, gonna, like I said, he ain't going to quit. But when you hold out, God will really bless you. So we thank God for his word. Pray for those who the devil is really bothering. You understand? And it, all of us ain't come from the same background. Some things, some people are fighting that some of us will never have to fight against. But pray for them, that the Lord will help them, and that they will see that he's right there to help them. Because I'm here to tell you, don't care what you're going through, God is right there to help you. You just need to know that. A lot of people don't know that. God, God, God don't leave you out there by yourself. God knows your weaknesses and God knows your problems. You, you, some people just need to know that. Just tell them. Say, look, God, God understands. Just ask him to help you. Just go to him and say, say, Lord, help me. And God will be right there to help you. He said, I know where you dwell. I know your temptation. I know your problems. I know the situation you're going through. But he said, but I'm right there. Just ask me for the help. Help will be right there. So let us stand, lift hand towards heaven. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore, all people of God saying, Amen. Shake somebody's hand and say, Jesus loves you.